actually. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Uh, we're delighted to have Professor Jennifer, Jenny Saul uh, speaking to us about implicit bias and stereotype uh, threat in academia, something that uh, is of, of, of concern to us all, and whether we've experienced it or we're studying it or, or we, we were worried about it. So I'm, I'm sure you're going to give us a lot of tools to better understand this problem and hopefully strategies of how to deal with it. Um, I think you'll be speaking in a kind of lecture format, and then there'll be time for questions uh, for questions uh, after that. Um, uh, Jenny, Jenny was the first uh, chair of the faculty uh, Equality, Equality and Diversity Committee. That's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and since then, uh, 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 I've recently taken over that role. Um, so I, I see her very much as an inspiration and as someone to whom I can go for, for advice. So I appreciate that. Um, and the Faculty uh, Equality and Diversity Committee has changed uh, slightly to become the Faculty Diversity and Inclusion Committee, um, which just means uh, more things to do in less time. Um, but we're doing our best. Uh, so, but this is our, our first pilot. My, well, the first event that we're running under uh, my chairmanship, Dominic um, McHugh, um, who is the deputy, uh, would normally be here, uh, but he's done a lot to, to support and to organize this. So just um, if you would welcome Jenny uh, to, to speak today and thank her very much for coming. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say right at the start, I have a little two-page handout of things one can do, which I'm going to pass on to Julie after this, and she can send it out to everyone rather than distributing paper copies. So we'll and we have a website, so we, and we might, put it yeah. up on the website. Yeah. That, that, that's fine too. Yeah. So you don't have to feel like you need to remember all those things. Okay. So yeah, I'm talking about implicit bias and stereotype threat. Um, can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. So I'm going to start um, with an embarrassing anecdote, which is always a good way to start. Um, and I want to say in advance, I, I love my department. I've been here since 1995. <laughs> and the reason I've been here all this time, I didn't plan to stay, but I stayed because I love my department so much. Um, it's been an absolutely wonderful place to be a woman, even a woman in what is a very male-dominated subject. Um, as I mentioned, philosophy is, it looks like one of the sciences rather than an arts and humanities subject in that regard. And yet. <laughs> um, so I started in 1995, and then in 1999, they hired another woman to a permanent academic post, and that was Rosanna Keith, who's now head of department. Um, <laughs> that brought us up to two, yay! Um, and that was probably at that time, you know, out of maybe 13, something like that. In the period from 1999 to 2012, we filled 10 new permanent academic posts, and every time, we really wanted to hire a woman. We knew it was bad that we didn't have women. Like I said, these are all a bunch of deeply committed feminist people, even the men. Um, I was on every committee as not just a feminist woman, but one who you know teaches feminism. Um, maybe one of those times I was on research leave and so Rosanna was on in my place. <laughs> we didn't hire any women at all that entire time. And every time, I was really convinced that it was a great shame, but this was the only possible decision that could have been made. I really genuinely thought, it wasn't that I had fights with my colleagues and they wanted to hire a man and I wanted to hire a woman and I lost. Um, every time, I agreed with the decision that we made, every single time. And then I started having um, arguments, discussions with my partner in which he, would say, you know, um, look, you've got a problem here. This, this pattern, you keep hiring men, you keep saying you want to hire women, and you keep hiring men. I know you're all very nice and feminist people, but look at yourselves. And I kept saying, no, 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 but you don't understand. We're all really feminist, <laughs> right? And he would say, look, you wouldn't accept this from somebody else. You shouldn't accept this from yourself. Okay. And I've, I've become convinced that, you know, he was in all likelihood right about this. At that time, I didn't understand 
the workings of things like implicit bias, which I want to tell you about. And this is part of my motivation for thinking it's so important to understand this, because even people of genuine goodwill can fail to take into account the way that implicit bias can influence the decisions they're making. Um, but a couple other things I want to draw out from that story. One is that the deeply committed feminist woman was screwing up. And another is that this man was the one who was pointing something out that I needed to listen to. So people often assume that um, putting a woman on a committee will fix things, or men often assume that they shouldn't speak up because they don't really have something to say that might be helpful, that they can't because they're men. But it, it doesn't go that way. This knowledge is not automatic, and sometimes women aren't the ones who have it. So, yeah, what I'm going to talk about in this talk is mechanisms that can bring about results like the one we saw in my department, where you have good, genuinely egalitarian people who are perpetuating inequality. And I'm going to tell you a bit about how we can and should take actions to combat that. So I'll start with a little bit of factual background. Um, I guess people are probably aware that there are low numbers of women in STEM subjects. This is something that gets a lot of attention, um, especially in fields like engineering, where it's just 23% female. Um, but there are other fields that get less attention, which also have this kind of issue. Um, philosophy is 24% female. It looks a lot like engineering in the UK. In the US, it's 17%. This is you know, permanent full-time staff. In Canada, it's like 30-something, so you know, there's a little bit of variation there. But none of this is looking good. Um, there are other People tend not to notice that there are issues in arts departments because they look at what the arts faculty looks like, and it looks roughly equal, usually. And that's because there are some fields that are heavily weighted toward women and some fields that are heavily weighted toward men. Um, there are some fields that do have gender parity, but it's not the norm. Um, economics in the social sciences is another field that's overwhelmingly male. Another one in arts faculty is theology. <coughs> I don't know about the makeup of your own departments, but you probably do to some extent. In almost every field, even if a field is roughly at gender parity, there's low numbers of women at the top. And so I've often told, you know, I talk about the small number of women in philosophy, I get women from other fields saying, don't think you're going to fix it when you get more women in. That doesn't fix it. And in some fields, and this is a thing, a thing that is important to notice, there are low numbers of men. And just as the low numbers of women in some fields are related to gender stereotypes that we should be worried about, I think the low numbers of men can also be related to gender stereotypes that we should be worried about. So for example, very obvious case of that would be low numbers of men in nursing, where it's very, you know, caring is very heavily stereotyped as a task for women. And that's definitely a stereotype that we should all want to fight. And men can do caring too. But gender is not the only problem in UK academia. It's not the worst problem in UK academia. Um, race in UK academia is a huge problem. There are very low numbers of black minority ethnic students and staff in academia. Um, Russell Group Universities have 2.6% of their undergraduate students are black, which is very low. Um, the youth population is only 3.9% black, but even relative to that, it is very low. There are 95 black professors in the UK total. This may have changed, may have gone up or down by one or two since this statistic was gathered, but that's the most recent statistic I've seen. And a recent study showed that black minority ethnic academics were significantly more likely to be considering moving overseas. And when asked about why, they're citing a desire for a more hospitable environment. Of course, at the time of this survey, they were talking about moving to America. <laughs> <laughs> and this was, you won't be surprised, before the 2016 election. <laughs> so there are a lot of explanations available for the gender gap. And some of them are good, some of them aren't. I'm not going to be talking about all of them. 
Um, so obviously, one of the most popular ones in the press and in society at large is that there are innate, unchangeable gender differences between men and women. And these mean they have different kinds of minds that are suited to different kinds of tasks, and we all need to just accept that. Um, and that's what's produced the division we see. Now, we don't actually know in detail exactly what innate and unchangeable psychological differences there may be, because it's very hard to find that out. Right? We do know that lots of things that were previously thought to be innate and unchangeable have turned out to be changeable. And we do have studies seem to show that the, the only kinds of differences that are actually well confirmed are very small and wouldn't lead to the differences that we in fact see in the world. A really great book about this is Cordelia Fine's book, Delusions of Gender. Um, she's a psychologist and she goes through the data on this really well but in a very, very readable and fun way. So I strongly recommend that. Could it be that it's difficult to combine work and childcare and women are more likely than men to have substantial child care duties. Yes, these things are true. It is in fact difficult to combine with child care, and it is in fact true that women tend to bear more of the brunt of their work. But that wouldn't explain what we see in the world, because there are a lot of women in French departments and not many women in philosophy departments. And it's not the case that the women in philosophy departments have lots more babies than the women in French departments. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not going to explain what we're seeing. Could it be conscious, old-fashioned, explicit sexism, people who think that women are just less smart than men are, less deserving of good jobs? That certainly does exist. Um, I think we're all, at this point, over the last year, we've become more conscious of its continued existence than we might have been before. But even before that, you know, there are still prominent people in my field and probably in your fields who hold that kind of view. Um, but I don't think that explains the extent of what we see. I think that view isn't hugely well represented in academia. I, it, I could turn out to be wrong about that, that would be very sad, but I don't think it's hugely well represented. Could it be that women, more than men, suffer quite a lot of sexual harassment um, in these fields where they're underrepresented? <coughs> well, I think sexual harassment is a big problem in academia, and it's something that I also work on and have written on, and I can give a different talk on it. Um, I don't think it's going to explain everything that we see, but I think it is a factor, so you know, people can talk to me about that at the end if they want to. What I want to focus on here is a couple of largely, but not entirely, unconscious psychological phenomena that I think are playing a role. We have good reason to think they're playing a role. Okay, so I'm going to go quickly through explanations for the race gap, the way that non-white people are so underrepresented in British academia. Here I'm planning to get a pause over the innate unchangeable differences hypothesis. I'm just going to say no. Um, could it be that there's a lot of economic inequality linked to race, and this makes it harder for people from certain groups to access higher education? Yes, that is a significant factor, and it's one that deserves attention. Um, could it be that there's still explicit racism? I think it's pretty clear there is still explicit racism. Um, but also, in addition, there are these largely unconscious psychological phenomena that are playing, I think, a significant role and that we can do something about. And one reason I'm talking in both these cases about these unconscious psychological phenomena that people of goodwill are prone to rather than the explicit racism and sexism, one reason is that it's in a way easier to do something about it and make some progress. Because you find the people of goodwill, they're a goodwill, they'd like to change, they'd like to make things better. And so you tell them how to make things better and they'll enthusiastically go off and do it. Right, so you can make some progress. And I think it's good to make some progress. <laughs> right, so I'm going to first distinguish implicit biases and stereotype threat. So what I'm going to be focused on here are implicit biases that are largely unconscious associations that affect the way that we perceive and interact with and judge people who are from groups in our society that are either stigmatized or valorized. So you can have a negative or a positive because of bias. And stereotype threat is quite a different phenomenon, but it's often discussed at the same time, um, which is 
where people's own awareness of their group membership can actually impair their performance on certain tasks that their group is perceived as bad at. So first, implicit bias. Um, implicit bias, um, as I'm discussing it, is clearly a bad thing, but it's worth noting that it comes from a very useful tendency that humans have. Our minds form fast associations, and this is good. So if there's a fire here, I'm not going to go over to it and think, hmm, it's kind of orangey, yellow, I wonder if it's warm, oh, that feels nice, what if I get closer, right? right? You don't do that, you quickly associate with danger, you run away, you, you know, shout for help, you do something. And these fast associations are a useful thing that have helped humans to survive, but they go kind of wrong when we make these fast automatic associations and act on them when they're concerned with social groups. Because then we get into some pretty serious mistakes that lead us astray. And it's crucial to note that not always, but often, these are contrary to genuine, deeply held commitments that go in the other direction. And they can be held even by people who are members of the group targeted by the biases. So I have here a picture of Jesse Jackson, um, very famous civil rights campaigner in the United States. He's devoted his entire life to fighting racism. But he tells a story of what he says is the most, most painful experience he's had, which is realizing that if he's walking alone late at night through an unfamiliar city and he hears footsteps behind him, turns around and he's relieved if he sees that it's a white man. <coughs> what this is, is Jesse Jackson's implicit bias, he's rising up to consciousness and making him aware of them. He's realizing that because he's grown up in this racist culture, he's internalized certain associations and they affect his assumptions and behavior. It's not Jesse Jackson turning out to actually be a liar who didn't really care about racism. He's devoted his life to fighting racism. There's no room for doubt on this point. Right? It's not that Jesse Jackson really does believe in some strong conscious sense that black men are dangerous. He knows quite a lot of black men, really well. Right? And he's devoted his life to fighting those stereotypes. It's that, despite all of that, he's still affected by the stereotypes of the culture that he was raised in. So if you want to find out about your own biases, or your own, I should say, well, so if you want to find out a bit about your own biases, you can go to Project Implicit. It's a website that Harvard runs, and you can take implicit association tests for a whole bunch of different kinds of biases you might have. It's crucial that you select the right nationality for you, whatever that is, because it will default to American. <coughs> in American categories, and categories are drawn in different ways in different countries, and different associations are the ones you're looking for. So be sure you select the right one for your nationality. Um, and you might find it interesting to actually take it on different days, at different times, because one of the things that you'll be finding out in this talk is that what you've just been thinking about or looking at can very much affect what implicit biases are affecting you soon after. So how does this affect academia? Well, one thing we know um, from the few studies that have been done on this, it's a very hard thing to study, is that anonymous marking leads to higher marks for women. I should say, great thing about this country is the anonymous marking. This is pretty much unknown everywhere else I go. I don't know how it's come to be completely widespread here and unheard of elsewhere, but it's a, it's a great thing that we have this. Um, there's a recent study where they were looking at anonymous marking in elementary school math classes, and they found that gave, led to higher marks for the girls. It also made the girls more likely to want to carry on in the subject. That study also studied anonymous marking from boys in writing and reading, and they found that the boys did better with anonymous marking in those subjects which are stereotyped as female. Another place this shows up is in letters of reference. So there was a nice study done where they looked at the most common phrases in letters of reference for men and women. And 
here are the kinds of things that people say about men. Brilliant, outstanding, original. These are, these are the things you want in your letter of reference, quite obviously, right? This is for an academic post. The women don't get those all. They get other things. <laughs> they get works hard. Which is, it, it, let's admit, it's a good thing. <laughs> right? I want to hire someone who works hard rather than somebody who doesn't work hard. But it's not going to get you to the top of the pile the way that brilliant is. <laughs> Friendly. Another thing that is good. Right? Genuinely good. But it's not going to get you to the top of the pile. And these fit well with the stereotype of women as nice and gentle and hardworking and detail-oriented and they'll, they'll scrub those floors all day if they need scrubbing, right? Change all the nappies. And they'll smile while they do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> they get to more questionable ones, like surprisingly successful. Women get more of what are called doubt raisers than men do. They also get more irrelevant comments. <laughs> like, friends with my wife, and very attractive. People don't tend to comment on men's appearance. <coughs> when this study came out, lots of friends of mine on Facebook went through their own letters of reference and found that they were falling into this too. And I, I found this. I, I mean, I'm pleased to say that I never described a woman as surprisingly successful or friends with my wife or very attractive, but I did find that I was more likely to mention that a woman student of mine was friendly than a, a man student of mine was friendly, even though if the man was just as friendly. Mm -hmm. Now, I tend to think that being friendly is a good thing, and so now what this has made me do is to be sure to put that in the letters for the male students as well, because I think it's a genuinely good trait to have. But I've also gone, every time now, I'm also sure to look through and make sure that when I have a brilliant student, I say they're brilliant if it's a woman. In teaching, both men and women are more likely to call on male students. They're, if, you know, you know how students sometimes will make some kind of inchoate point that could be something really difficult and interesting that they're getting at, or they could be just saying stuff, right? People are more likely to take it seriously and think they're getting at something really interesting if it's said by a man. And if a woman makes a point that gets ignored, which happens very, very frequently in the business world as well as in academia, women's points are often ignored until they get restated by a man, and then they're attributed to that man. Um, research on race shows that people teaching black students who are not themselves black are likely to have low, significantly lower expectations of those students. This is not a bias that the black teachers have heard. Um, there are lovely, lovely studies done of CVs, where what they do is they take the same CV and they stick a different name at the top of it, selecting names that are typical of a particular race or gender. And what they find is what you'd predict if you had a really cynical view. Okay, so the male name does better than the female name. Consider, you know, you offer them a higher salary, you'd be more likely to invite them to interview. The white sounding name does better than the non white sounding name. And that's exactly the same CV. If you tweak the study a little bit, you can find out what parenthood does to a CV. Um, the way you tweak it is you add on an additional accomplishment, like president of the Parent Teacher Association. And that additional accomplishment sends the woman's CV down to the bottom of the pile, but sends the man's CV to the top. Um, the most recent version of the gender study I've seen was 2012, which is now a little while ago. Um, but what it showed at that time was that men and women were equally prone to prefer the male CV to the female one. And this affected men and women of all ages equally. So it's not just that it was, you know, a few people who were going to retire in a couple of years anyway. But the youngest people show the same level of bias as the oldest. One 
of the reasons we should be glad that the ref doesn't run on citations and that it's like ours managed to resist going too much for a citation model is that citation seems to be something which is affected by implicit bias. Men are cited significantly more than women. Um, so a recent study looked at the average paper by an untenured male in international relations was cited 26.7 times, while the average paper by a woman at the same rank, same kind of university, was cited 21.5 times. Um, I should say the easiest way if you ever need to push back against using citation rates in arts and humanities, the easiest way to push back against it is not by citing this. It's by noting the fact that I think in the arts and humanities as a whole, the average number of citations for a paper is less than one. <laughs> <laughs> so I think citations not something we don't have to worry about citations taking over the way that we're evaluated in the arts and humanities, which is good. Um, I have never seen a study where they take the same paper with male and female names and see how it's viewed, but they have done a study with the same abstract with male and female names. And predictably, with the male author, it's considered to be higher quality, especially if it was on a stereotypically male topic. So the effect was there on other topics, but it was strongest with stereotypically male topics. And there was more interest in collaborating with the male author Again, especially if it was a stereotypically male topic. These judgments, these biases, were just as strong in women as in men. I should say an interesting factor that I've alluded to, but I want to draw out because it's interesting. Um, race and gender biases work differently in a lot of ways. Here's one. Um, women show the same levels of anti-woman bias that men do in general. But while it is true that the majority of black Americans, who are the group that's been studied the most in race studies, the majority of black Americans do show some level of race bias, it's way lower than the level that white Americans show. So, so women are much more likely to be biased against women than blacks are against blacks. <clears throat> there was a study done a couple years ago now, I think, um, where they sent the same email to various potential PhD supervisors saying, hi, I'm working on this topic and I'd be interested in meeting with you to discuss it. Well, maybe I could do a PhD. <coughs> um, they varied the names in terms of gender and like the racial group. And they found that the supervisors were far more likely to respond to an email from a prospective research student who seemed to be a white man. So this you know, sort of thing could well be affecting postgrad recruitment. There are lots and lots of studies on women in leadership, um, which I think is probably something I think Julie knows a lot about this from another perspective. Um, so, we're not surprised, I guess, that, that women have a lot of time, a, a lot of difficulty being taken seriously and being liked as leaders. Um, but I'm just going to mention one of these studies because it's just so simple. You take a picture like this one and you ask people who is the leader in this room. 100% of people will pick the guy at the head of the table. If you get them a picture like this, which is structurally the same, head of the table standard marker of leadership, over 50% of people will pick the woman at the head of the table. So women have literally twice as hard a time being recognized as leaders. Gender biases show up in student evaluation of lecturers, and this is something that I, I think it needs to be taken very seriously in academia because we do put such great weight on student evaluations of lectures. It's something that we should care about for the NSS, but it's also something we should care about for promotion. So it, you might think you couldn't do those studies where you have the same thing being evaluated, <laughs> thought of as male and female, but you can. Um, so they've done studies of online teaching, where you've got exactly the same instructor <coughs> posing out a male name for some students and a female name for other <coughs> students. 
and students gave substantially higher ratings to that instructor when they thought they were male than when they thought they were female. Um, there's another study where they looked, I think this was across a number of different fields and not lots of different classes, a large correlational study, where they looked at the student evaluations and they, I'm not sure how they managed to do this, but they did. They checked them against the marks that the students received in the class. This is where the students are getting the, filling out the evaluations after they get the marks. And women received lower student evaluations from men if they gave students low marks. They were okay if they gave the students high marks, but their evaluations were lower if they gave the students low marks. The men could get away with giving low evaluations in a way that, low marks in a way that the women couldn't. The psychologist who told me about this said that after he read that study, he started advising his women PhD students to be easy markers until they get tenure. Implicit biases also show up in micro behaviors, which are things that we may not be aware of, but they affect our interaction, things like how much eye contact you're making. <coughs> um, and even if you're not aware that you're doing it, other people can be aware that it's happening. So there's, there are lots of studies showing that white people don't make as much eye contact with non-white people. And that study of black and minority ethnic academics in the UK specifically mentioned black and minority ethnic academics complaining about lack of eye contact in meetings. So even though people may not be aware that they're doing the eye contact thing, the recipients are noticing it and it's making them uncomfortable. And that does seem to correlate with implicit bias. Okay. Now move on to, I should, maybe I should stop for a minute and see, do people have questions about implicit bias before I move on to search? Okay, so I'll tell you about stereotypes right now. Okay, so this is, as I said, it's a different kind of phenomenon where you've got members of a group that stereotyped as not good at some particular task. I'm phrasing this carefully for a reason. Um, and what happens to them is that they underperform on those tasks or they avoid those tasks or those fields of endeavor under certain circumstances. If they really care about doing well, if the stakes are high, and the task is difficult. And crucially, something has to remind them of the stereotype, like the way the task is framed or like being <clears throat> reminded of their group membership, being asked to take a gender box on a you know, thing before you fill out the test. In some cases, we'll see, um, the task framing is so pervasive that they don't even need to be reminded in any other way, just the fact that they're doing this task is enough. So, one of the most studied kinds of stereotype threat is girls underperforming at math, girls and women underperforming at math. Um, there's been a study done with five to seven year old girls where what you do is you have them take a math test after doing some coloring. And they do worse on the math test if they've just been coloring in a picture of a girl holding a baby doll, which is a gendered picture, than if just, they've just been coloring in a picture of a sunset. And it's remarkable that this is actually occurring at five to seven years old. I mean, in general, five to seven years old, girls are actually doing a lot better in school than boys, but they somehow picked up that math is not a girl thing. And so five to seven year olds need to be reminded of it. By the time you get to adulthood, women don't need to be reminded that they're women and that math is <laughs> um, women will underperform on a high stakes math test unless you do something to specifically remove that stereotype threat. So if you tell them, this is a math test that we have tested on men and women several times and we've discovered that men and women do equally well on it, then the women's marks go up. The women's marks are better than if you don't tell them that. So interestingly, this means the study was done based on this thought. Let's, let's take a group of men and women who do equally well in math. All these people who have been admitted to this engineering program all do equally well in math. And then remove the stereotype threat 
And it turns out what you do, if you do in that case, by telling them that women and men do equally well on this test, the women do better than the men. Because their equal performance was what you get when they're under stereotype threat. And with the stereotype threat, then the women's performance goes up. So, all this math stuff, how's it relevant to the arts? Well, art subjects can involve elements that provoke math-related stereotypes. You know, anything that's statistical that might be going on in some art subject will do that. The one I know best is philosophy, where there's a very strong emphasis on logic, which is basically a kind of math. And so we suspect that the math stereotype carries over and does some work in dissuading women from philosophy, but it's something that hasn't been properly studied. But also, there are going to be lots of other kinds of gender-related stereotypes that haven't been studied so much, which may be affecting performance. And we don't know about that because nobody's been studying art subjects. There's tons of research money that's been put into studying stereotype threat in STEM subjects because STEM subjects are important for the national economy. <laughs> but somehow people don't think that about art subjects, sadly. And so no one's pouring money into that. Um, and it's also important to remember that a place where arts subjects have a really huge problem is with their whiteness. And stereotype threat related to race and ethnicity is something that's been studied. So again, the studies of this have mostly been in the US, um, but they're pretty horrifying. So they've studied black men in the US taking tests at university that they take to be tests of academic ability. Now, it's going to be really hard to not think of lots of tests of, at university as tests of academic ability. But it turns out black men in the US will underperform if they think the test is a test of academic ability, which is going to be really general. Um, but, sorry, if you tell them that you're just looking, that what you're doing is that this test is a way of studying the reasoning strategies that people employ, their performance goes right way up. If they're not thinking of it as a test of academic ability, their performance improves drastically. Um, now, I mentioned before that I was phrasing this carefully, and it's because stereotype threat can affect groups that aren't in general the stigmatized groups in society that we worry about. So, we can probably all agree that white men at Ivy League universities in the U.S. are not a group that we worry about much. <laughs> but, if you tell them they're taking a test of athletic ability and remind them of how white they are, they underperform. If you tell them you're studying human physiology, their performance goes up. So stereotype threat can affect anyone. Um, solo status is something that doesn't affect just anyone. Um, it tends to be members of stigmatized groups. So women and African Americans, if they're the only person in a group, will perform worse. Men and white Americans, if they're the only one of that Sorry, I didn't say the only person in the group, did I say that? So if a woman's the only woman in a group, or an African American's the only African American in a group, they'll perform worse. But if you're the only man in a group, you don't perform worse. If you're the only white person in a group, you don't perform worse. You might feel uncomfortable, but it doesn't appear your performance. So now I'm going to do, do about questions about the phenomena at this point before I move on to things you can do. OK, I'll tell you some things you can do. Then. Um, and this is what will be on the handout. One thing I want to mention, though, is that I'm, I'm presenting these things that you can do as things that you can do to fight implicit bias and stereotype threat, and they are. But most of them are also things which, once you start thinking about them, seem like a good idea anyway. They're things that are worth doing for a whole host of reasons, not just because of implicit bias and stereotype threat. And that can be a useful thing if you're trying to convince people to adopt them, for example. I'll start with what not to do, what's not going to solve the problem for you. So, key thing not to do is to think that being aware of a problem is going to solve it. Um, and this is actually a problem with a lot of implicit bias training courses. They'll tell you about the problem, they'll explain the problem, and then they'll send you away. Turns out that being aware of implicit bias on its own, it makes it worse. It doesn't help. It makes you more biased in your behavior. You have to, it, because you have to actually do specific things to combat this. And if you're not told what those things are, you're not motivated to do them, it's not going to get any better. Just being aware that implicit bias is a thing and it's widespread 
actually tends to lead to the thought, oh, well, what can you do? Another thing not to do that well-intentioned people do is tell themselves, don't be biased, don't be biased. It's really important not to be biased, don't be biased. Nothing wrong with wanting not to be biased. <laughs> it's a fine thing to want. But just telling yourself, don't be biased, may suppress the bias for the task you're doing at that instant, but it has what's called a boomerang effect. And it actually makes the problem worse. It makes you more biased after that. One of the reasons for that is that we seem to be very good at telling ourselves, oh, look, I succeeded in not being biased, now I can relax. <laughs> but a big reason for this is also that that's not something that solves the problem. There are specific things that do, and that's not one of them. Don't tell yourself not to see gender or race. You'll just be deluding yourself. Everybody sees gender and race. In fact, people who say they don't see gender and race are the ones that you really should worry about. <laughs> right? We all see gender and race. Interestingly, don't tell yourself to be objective. Priming people with the concept of objectivity makes them display more bias. Which may be why philosophy is such a problem with gender. <laughs> Um, so all of those can make it worse. They're common strategies and they make it worse. Here's something that only sort of works. <laughs> we know this from my anecdote. Stick a woman on the hiring committee so it'll be gender fair. It's, it does not solve the problem. It can help a little bit with stereotype threat because then the job candidate is not the only woman in the room, but one other woman in the room probably isn't going to be enough to do it. And, you know, huh. So yes, as I said, women, like men, are likely to hold the negative gender biases and help a stereotype threat. Okay. The one woman in the room can do something else. She can, if she's the right sort of woman, she can serve as what's called a counter-stereotypical exemplar. A counter-stereotypical exemplar is a member of the stereotype group who doesn't fit the stereotype. And reflecting on a counter-stereotypical exemplar is something that's been shown to be quite effective in suppressing implicit bias and in reducing stereotype threats. So if you think about Martin Luther King, if you look at a picture of Martin Luther King for a few minutes before you take the race implicit association test, you're much less likely to show negative bias against black people. Um, if you are suffering from stereotype threat, you know, if you're a woman in a math class and you think about a famous woman mathematician before going into the math test, your performance is better. Okay. So counter-stereotypical exemplars can be powerful. But if you're going after that, you need to get the right woman on your committee. Okay. You don't want it to be the secretary, right? Because that's already stereotyped as female. Right. You don't want it to be the representative from another department. You know, if, if, you're, if you're a philosophy department and you're all male and you want to hire some women, you really should bring in another woman philosopher from another university. You shouldn't ask somebody from the French department to come join you. Because that's not the stereotype you need to fight. The counter-stereotypical exemplar needs to be targeted at the stereotype that you're trying to fight. Counter-stereotypical exemplars are great, and there's lots of ways to get them around. Um, you can put pictures of them up on your walls, so one thing that we've done is we we don't just we used to have just a picture a bunch of pictures of white male philosophers on the walls. Right? You can go out of your way to get a lot of pictures of a more diverse group of people to put on your walls. You can also put them on your reading lists, right? um, so that your students are engaging with work by these people. And one thing that is quite important, not necessarily for implicit bias, but it, it's seems a good thing to do for a lot of reasons, <coughs> is diversifying the content, not just the authorship. So um, the one thing is that this can be helpful because you might you know, say, well, there aren't any women who write on this topic that I'm teaching. You know, well, okay, maybe you should broaden the topics that you're teaching a little bit, and then you can get a more diverse reading list. So that's one reason for it. But another thing is that people feel more welcome in an environment where the issues that are important to them are being taken seriously. So be in the academics are, you know, one of the reasons they're saying that they wanted to go to America before the 2016 election <laughs> um, was because there are departments of African American studies there and they feel that those issues are taken more seriously. So taking the issue seriously is an important thing to do. Um, <coughs> being sure that 
you invite members of stereotype groups to speak at your conferences and at your department seminars. Um, so try not to have all male conferences. Another thing you can do is hire them. <laughs> not just put their pictures up. They don't have to put pictures up so much. So how do you do that? Okay. Um, well, the standard objection to the thought that we should hire them is that this is going against meritocracy. That means if you set out to try to hire some women or some black people, you're basing your decision on something other than merit. And my answer to that is yes, but our judgments were already based on something other than merit. The CD studies showed that when evaluating the exact same CD, you assess it differently depending on what you think the gender of the person is, or what you think the race of the person is, that's not merit. So our current judgments are based on these inherited prejudices that we've you know, absorbed from our society. And that's not anything we should be wanting to stick by. Another point worth noting is that actually, <coughs> you know, if what we're doing is looking at two equally qualified candidates, one male, one female. You know, and in fact, UK law says that if you've got an underrepresentation issue in your field, so like in philosophy, if I've got a male and female candidate who we score equally, we have reason to favor the female because we have an underrepresentation issue. Now, that can be argued to actually be merit-based, and here's how which is that if they both achieve to the same level, but the woman is suffering from stereotype threat and the man isn't, then she's probably got more ability because she's had the stereotype threat holding her down. So if you hire this person and put them in an environment where they can flourish, you'll probably be getting a better performance. So from my um, most controversial bit, I'll go my least controversial, which is that um, one of the things I've been most excited to discover about implicit bias is that consumption of glucose reduces the manifestation of implicit bias. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, every time you're making higher decisions, you should have a platter like this on the table. It is, you know, an equality and diversity requirement that we all need to take really seriously. <laughs> um, but I think not just for that, obviously marking, you know, it's a, it's a non line but sometimes, you know, I mean, you can't be too careful. And, and implicit bias might affect you at any point, like when you're in the queue at the shop or something, so really, you know, bear it in mind. Um, more generally, being hungry, tired, and rushed makes, it increases manifestation of implicit bias. Um, and judges give out much harsher sentences as lunchtime approaches, <laughs> which is a really disturbing fact. Now, we can't do a lot about being tired and rushed for the most part. That's kind of a fact of life. We can do something about being hungry, but I think we should also think about ways we can do things about being tired and rushed. I mean, sometimes hiring is done in a really rushed way that it doesn't have to be done. I've been on committees where I've been sent 20 applications to read at 6 p.m. the night before with a 9 a.m. meeting. That's really bad to implicit bias. Right? And there's no, nothing is ever that urgent, or almost nothing. Right? So try to keep a decent pace of these things and have breaks so that people aren't getting painful and cranky and hungry. Um, then there are things that can help in terms of how you conduct the hiring discussion. So it's very important to agree in advance on criteria and not just on what the criteria are, but on how you're going to weight them. Because there are studies which show um, so if you've got a post that requires both on-the-job experience and credentials, you've got a man and a woman applying, if the man has the on-the-job experience but not the credentials, then people suddenly start thinking on-the-job experience is the important thing. If the man has the credentials but not the on-the-job experience, then people start thinking the credentials are the important thing. So agreeing on how you're going to weight those criteria before you look at the candidates is really important. 
Another thing worth thinking about in your own procedures is trying not to put too much weight on an element that's especially likely to provoke stereotype threat. So in my own field, philosophy, the standard way to conduct a job search is that a crucial part of it is the job talk, where the speaker, who is usually a woman in a room full of almost exclusively men, well, not usually a woman, obviously not, <laughs> but it's usually a room of almost exclusively men, so you've got a female speaker in this really high-stakes situation, and the men ask incredibly aggressive questions designed to destroy her talk. I mean, which is what philosophers do with anyone. It's not <laughs> philosophers are jerks. <laughs> um, but this is going to be an incredibly stereotype threat provoking situation. And philosophy departments tend to put the greatest weight on the performance of the job talk. And so I've been arguing that instead of putting so much weight on that, you should look at actually the published work, because that shows the work this person is capable of. I mean, yes, you're finding out something interesting about how they perform in a certain sort of pressured environment through the job talk, but which matters more? Probably the quality of the research. Um, another thing that's important to do is that you don't let people walk into the room at the end and say, oh, I just really like Smith. Smith's great. Yeah, Jones, Jones sucks. You don't let them do that. You get feedback substantive feedback on each element as you go, rather than allowing those gestalt judgments. Because when you allow those gestalt judgments, there's much more room to give your biases free play. <coughs> Anonymizing is a great thing to do for implicit bias. Because obviously, if you don't know what group somebody's coming from, you can, your associations aren't going to kick in about those groups. It works pretty well with marking. Um, it can work with some kinds of jobs. <coughs> I have this picture here um, because this is, this is my cousin Gail, actually. And she spent 10 years unemployed trying to get a job as a French horn player in a US orchestra. And then in the 1970s, US orchestras brought in a procedure of having applicants audition behind a screen so that all you got was the sound of their playing. You didn't get to see them at all. And this is something that's considered one of the great success stories of anonymous hiring. Because what happened was there was suddenly a huge, huge increase in the number of women getting jobs in US orchestras. And so she went from 10 years unemployment to the Chicago Symphony as soon as they brought in that curtain. Now, this is a little bit more difficult to implement in academia. <laughs> if you want somebody who's going to be a good teacher, say, you can't find out about them by having them teach from behind a curtain. <laughs> and you'd have to like distort their voice, too, which would be weird. But I think there, it's nonetheless the case that there are parts of the process you can anonymize, and I've done that here. Um, so you can look at the CVs without the names. You can look at writing samples very easily without names. There are bits that you can anonymize that can improve the process. Okay. So what we did in brief is we, we asked for anonymous CVs and anonymous cover letters that we use for long listing. Um, if you want to do this, you actually also have to make sure that you've got an administrator who will look through these and make sure that they actually are anonymized because people mess it up. Also, the online system messes this up because it puts the names in the names of the documents when you download them, even if they're not originally in the names of the documents. So you have to have somebody whose job it is to strip that off. It's not a huge job, but it has to be done. Um, and then for shortlisting, one time I did it this way. I, um, at the initial stage, I, we looked at just the CVs and writing samples of the people who we long listed. Um, and then we had a stage where we got the names of the candidates and we looked at the references. Um, I no longer do it that way. Um, I guess one, one good thing about getting the names is that you can make sure that you haven't by mistake ended up with an all-male shortlist. Right, so that's a good thing. Um, I think references are a really pernicious part of the process. I, I used to be frustrated by the by HR's view that you should get references when you shortlist, you know, after shortlisting. I now think that's right um, because 
anonymizing reference isn't going to solve the kind of problem we saw with references, that women tend to get certain adjectives that aren't as good as the adjectives men get. Right? Taking off the names isn't going to fix that. It's going to be a lot of work and it's not going to fix it. Um, I also think references display huge national biases. National biases that hurt British students. Right? Every American candidate <laughs> is described as the greatest thing since sliced bread. They're going to set the field on fire. And a similarly qualified British candidate is described as maybe having a future in the subject. Right? British understatement really harms British candidates. So I think, we, I think for, for the sake of Britain, <laughs> um, we should be looking at references as part of the decision procedure. Okay, so then I had these highly structured discussions by the panel after the job talks and interviews. Um, in which we went through all of our criteria one by one and discussed each candidate on those criteria. We had, you know, so we had for each candidate we talked about the written separately, the written work, their job talk, the presentation of the job talk, their responses to questions, because those are different things, how appropriate they were to the area, their teaching experience, their collegiality, all the things we want to talk about, we made sure we talked about them separately. Um, I didn't allow any comparative or overall judgments until the very end. And um, I had a constant <laughs> stream of snacks throughout. And interestingly, both when we had candidates who were decisions that were difficult to make, where we had a couple candidates who were both really good, and cases where the decision was really easy, everybody felt this was a great procedure. Even in the easy case, they said, I'm still glad that we discussed everyone in detail. It feels like a better decision process. So there's some variants on this you can use. Um, so some people think you should actually construct your long list non-anonymously, trying to ensure you get a diversity of candidates. And there's a case that can be made for that. Um, you might strive for a particular percentage of women on your long list. And then you can still introduce anonymity for looking at the writing samples. Another thing that some people think you should do um, is I think you, you have to really trust the goodwill of your colleagues in this kind of case. Um, but you could just say, look, no, we don't want to have anonymity because we really want to practice affirmative action. We want to stop being so white and male, and we need to be non-anonymous for that. So I think also there are things that can be done in, that come up in discussion techniques, which are for like teaching, for chairing papers, for participating in discussions, so they come up all over the place. Um, trying harder to notice when members of underrepresented groups want to speak, not just calling on the men. Um, if someone's comments getting ignored or being attributed to someone else, you can just very easily say, hey, Sally said that. Then there's what I call active chairing to prevent a few people from dominating discussion. This is, again, one of those things I think can be justified totally <coughs> independently of implicit bias, but it's great for implicit bias. Um, so in philosophy, an issue that we have is that the norm mm -hmm. in the field is to first call on the most high status person in the room, who's usually an older white man, um, and then they ask a 14 part question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if this is true. I get the impression it might be true in other fields too. So what I have introduced is what I call the one question per question rule. And if you have more questions, you can go on at the back of the queue. And what's really nice about that rule is once you state it, you really, you can't argue with it. It's an obviously sensible rule. And although the person with the 14-part question might be a little bit annoyed, everybody else is really glad because there's much more chance that they're going to get to say something. And in fact, everyone benefits from hearing a whole bunch more perspectives than they'd have heard otherwise. Right? So it's, it's totally justifiable in that way. Um, also, when I'm running a conference, you know, with lots of different sessions, but you can do the same thing in a department seminar, call on the people who haven't spoken much. If somebody who never puts their hand up puts their hand up, let them jump the queue. And you'll get to hear from a perspective you haven't heard from before. So you don't have to go in just the strict order of when people put their hand up. And again, I think it can be justified quite independently. Um, so it's a good idea to go look at your letters of reference for gender content, like I did. Um, look at your bibliographies and think whether there are some women you should cite. Again, this is something where when all the philosophers start doing and writing about on Facebook, they're all saying, oh my god, I can't believe the things I left off my bibliography. It's surprising. And part of that is there are the standard people who you cite when you discuss this topic. And they're probably going to be white men. And there are probably other people who are doing really good work that deserves to be cited. 
Um, I'm going to get over time, so I'm going to skip these bias suppression techniques. Um, I'll skip that one too. I want to talk a bit about some interventions for stereotype threat, because I've talked a lot about implicit bias. Um, so as I mentioned, reflecting on counter stereotypical exemplars can be a helpful thing. Um, thinking about people in your field or from the stereotype groups. Another thing that's really good is sharing stories from members of the stereotype group who succeeded. And so one way that people implement this quite commonly <coughs> is if you've got a visiting speaker who are, who's from a member of, who's from an underrepresented group, have them like go to lunch with the grad students and just relax with them and chat, or have them talk a bit about their you know have an hour long session where they talk about their career or something like that. And they've studied this with um, African American men at Ivy League schools. And the ones who received the intervention of hearing from somebody else in their group, talking about how, you know, how things went for them and how they overcame problems, they turned out to do a full letter grade better that year in their overall grade average. So it made a very substantial difference. Talking about stereotype threat as a possible source of anxiety is also useful. Um, saying things like, you know, look, you're a woman in a math class. You may be feeling uncomfortable and like you're, you know, like you can't handle this. This is called stereotype threat. It is no indication of your ability. This is just the thing that happens to women in math classes. Again, it's improved marks by a full letter grade. Um, another thing that is very destructive <coughs> is a very widespread view, what's called the entity view of intelligence. Um, the idea that we each have a fixed amount of intelligence. <coughs> you know, some of us are lucky and have a lot, some of us are less lucky and don't have so much. Um, it has, there are lots of bad effects of this view, as you might expect. Um, but in addition to the more predictable bad effects, it increases implicit bias and stereotype threat. And really that kind of makes sense, right? It, it's hard to, hard to feel stereotype threat against your group if you don't feel, have this kind of view in the, in the background somewhere. But it also specifically seems to be linked to the underrepresentation of women and black people in academia. So there was a study done a couple of years ago. What they did was they surveyed members of all fields of academia in the US about the extent to which they think success in their field is based on innate ability <coughs> and the extent to which they think it's based on other factors. And the fields that put the highest premium on innate ability were the ones with the lowest representation of women and black people. Um, another way of thinking about this is the destructiveness of the genius stereotype. And of course the genius stereotype is a white man. So if your field's built around the genius stereotype, this problem's going to be worse for you. So I think we, I think it's very easy to fall into talking about who's brilliant. It's, it's hard to avoid it, but it's worth doing. It's worth doing. Instead of talking about who's brilliant or who's a genius, um, you can discuss specific merits of specific pieces of work. You'll be having a better discussion, a more interesting discussion if you do that, too. Um, so, more broadly, I think thinking about phenomena like these means we can't just think of bias as something that, you know, a few bad people have. Um, and it means you're a bad person, and you know it needs to be stamped out. I think the way we need to think about it is quite different. We need to recognize that this is what you get from human nature in a flawed social context. And while human nature isn't tremendously malleable, um, social context is, and we need to reshape our social context so that these biases play less of a reigning role in them. And we need to pay attention to it repeatedly. So the background of this thought that it's just a part of human nature to have these biases and the part of our context that they'd be these pernicious ones um, is the thought that being biased is not always blameworthy. The tendency to implicit bias is a part of being human and if you're in the wrong cultural environment you're quite likely to get these biases. Many people are totally unaware of implicit bias, of the fact that they may have implicit biases, of the destructive effects that biases might be having in the world. And even after becoming aware, people 
are likely not to know the right things to do about it. They might think saying, don't be biased, don't be biased, don't be biased is the thing to do about it. So as a result of that, I think just having implicit biases isn't something people should be blamed for. However, I think if people learn about implicit bias and learn what to do about it, then and they don't want to do anything to change, and they don't even make an effort, that becomes blameworthy. And so this is where when I'm doing training events, I always apologize to my students by saying, um, you may have entered this room blameless. <laughs> Um, but I think there are a lot of things that can be done that we should all do. So, thanks. Mm -hmm. so I have a little bit of time for questions now. Yeah. Um, can you go to training for the white rose chairs who do the rocket student chips? We think about to, um, where there is scoring, but actually, you know, uh, and, you know, sort of so the, I have to say, Rocca instituted an anonymous. Right, I have so like this just this year. Right, I was so actually really pleased. I have not done any training. I haven't had anything that. to do with it, but I was pleased that they made that change. It, it might be work because you know, sort of, I think they they do care about these things. Yeah. Right? So, sort of having a, a chat with them would actually, in terms of the recruitment foundations that then you know lead on. Yeah. You know, that might be something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I mean I was very pleased that they moved to anonymity. Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, they, they, they are very bad on the, the brilliance one. So that, that's your top credit, you, your outstandingness. So it's basically um, being that person. I, I was going to ask you. Well, what, so oh, I, sorry. I think it is worth distinguishing between outstanding work and outstanding yes, person, sure. right? Sure. Yeah. And so the problem is with saying brilliant person. The problem yeah. is not with saying brilliant paper, not sure. right? So I, I think I think we can't get away from yeah. assessing work in that way, but yeah, yeah. But they do. There's a lot of talk of ability. Sure. Yeah. I was going to ask what if you think there's a relationship that it's sort of intractable oneness maybe between implicit bias and what one might call um, even discipline specific academic prejudices. So a, a, an academic prejudice between research and teaching, for example. Yeah. Which, um, which points towards valorizing certain attitudes over others and certain behaviors Absolutely. over others, which then might. So is there a relationship there, correlation? I think there can be a lot of complicated relationships. Yeah. So I think some of that's going to be explicit and some of it's implicit. I think a lot of people point explicitly value research over teaching. Mm -hmm. Right? But I think in other people it may be implicit. But then there are also going to be the ways that stereotypes affect those. So that you know women tend to not be assumed to be the great researchers and that sort of thing. So, so I think, and, and then they're going to be field specific things which may be either implicit or explicit and then the way that they interact with gender and race stereotypes may be implicit or explicit, but definitely. And as I said, nobody's studying the arts. So, you know, the Athena Swan has been rolled out to the arts, but it's all based on what we know about STEM subjects. <laughs> So it's about the whole interview process, because as you say, sometimes it's about references. If, if that's not looked at, that's a problem. <coughs> sometimes it's, I guess, the job advert. But just talking about snacks, I often think the interview day, the way we do in Britain, is just terrible. So we get people here at nine o'clock. We often stick them in a room together. Say, yes, that's terrible. You know, get on for eight hours. We give them terrible food halfway through, which we then expect them to talk. Yeah. Cleverly with us often. Yeah. And then we drag them in in the afternoon for an interview. And then we ourselves interview, sit in a room for an hour and say, right, let's make a decision. We're all yeah. tired, bothered. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know why we just often don't just say, right, at least we're going to meet the next day. But it's just those practical things. Yeah. Just about so I, I, think, I think that's right. And I, I mean, I guess I should have mentioned that because we, we don't do that. We never have. So we, um, we're a bit closer to the American model where we have people come and give job talks on different days yeah. and then have the interview. It takes longer, but it's, it's a more humane process and we get to know them better that way. Yeah. Um, we also don't do the thing where you stick them in a room together because that just seems, I mean, it, it seems like the basis for a really awful reality TV show. Yeah. <laughs> oh I just couldn't believe it was real when people told me about that. Um, but I think you're right, it also was gonna, you're gonna have very exhausted people rushing at the end of the day wanting to get the day over with and make a decision rather than wanting to make the best possible decision. Yeah. 
Um, Jenny, thanks ever so much. It's, it's obviously really important and, and it's good of you to come and there are lots of people in the room who will serve as catalysts for change. You know, both people of our generation and then there are many more junior people in the room who at some point will be chairing hiring committees. But there's an awful lot of people not here. And, you know, I think I've counted four people from my history department which means we're quite well represented, actually, <laughs> in this room. But still, that's appalling, frankly. I know everyone's busy. But so what do, What can you do, kind of, it's working with the structure, if you're a bit impatient, as I am, working with the structures, how is that happening now? How is that happening in the autumn? How do you actually get that to happen and get a culture to shift in the department if the people who actually might be making those decisions aren't coming to these events? Well, so, I mean, like I said, I am going to have this handout that, that will be sent around and put up on the website with, with all of these suggestions that you can take back. But then I think it is worth thinking about how to convince people in your departments of the reforms that you think would help your department. And, you know, I'd be happy to come talk to any department that wants me to come to a department meeting and talk to people about things. So that's one thing I can do. But you don't actually also, you don't have to teach people all of this to get some useful stuff done. Mm. I mean, there's more than one way to argue for a lot of these things. <coughs> and, you know, if people aren't receptive to implicit bias, um, you can tell them about the way that British people are, are you know, damaged by the references. You know, there, I mean, there are different techniques you can use for depending on what you think would be most useful in your department. And I'd be happy to talk to people about their departments and what they think would be most helpful and how to convince people of it. But I tend to be very cynical. There, there, there are always going to be some people who aren't going to come to an event like this. And if they do come, they will sit there being grumpy or reading something and ignoring it. You know, they're forced to come. Yeah. I, I think forcing people to come isn't necessarily a good way to go. Um, so I think it's worth just sort of thinking creatively about the individuals you're dealing with. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'm wondering a bit about, thank you, that was, that was very, very helpful. And I think it opened up all kinds of uh, questions, hopefully some solutions as well. Uh, but I'm thinking about the relationship between gender and competition. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that you know that competition and competitiveness, whether it's in the you know the job talk and the and the, and the search in search uh, context, or whether it's in departmental duties, mm -hmm. uh, the way that that women um, you know have diff more difficulty, of course, in these competitive often in these competitive situations, and that you know of course being competitive is a much more gender yeah. male yeah. Uh, trait and, and and ability for a lot of yeah and competitiveness is viewed as positive in men and as negative yeah. in women uh, but of course we're talking here about competitions yeah so i mean how do we control for that um <coughs> in, in these kind of um, situations yeah um well i think i think trying to to whatever, I mean, it's it's hard because a job, you know, a job search is just going to a hiring situation. Everyone knows it's competitive, but you can make it feel awful or not, right? You put all the candidates in a room and make them make conversation. You make them really aware of the competition thing. If you treat them more humanely, you're not. Um, I think if you if you have as your goal to destroy the see if you can destroy the speaker, that's a really awful competitive situation. But if you're just having a nice discussion about philosophy. <laughs> It's not as, you know, so there are ways that you can make those situations less competitive. And I think they're, you know, I think they're good anyway. Because I actually think it's more valuable to have a nice discussion about philosophy than to see if we can destroy the speaker. But I think in the same Which way, is a controversial view in my field. <laughs> <laughs> I think that as, a, as a, another aspect of that, I think sometimes um, women are made to compete against each other. Mm -hmm. Especially when there's imbal gender imbalance. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I know what, what there is an issue for women um, of getting certain kinds of roles in the department and not others. So there, there's a lot of evidence that um, women will tend to get the roles that require lots of work and little credit. Um, and you know, some of the, in particular, women will do a lot of the nurturing roles where they, you know, have to have three boxes of tissues in their office because they're likely to have lots of crying students, right? And that is a really important job that needs to be done and done well, but it's really emotionally grueling. Doesn't leave you a whole lot of energy for other things, and it's generally not properly appreciated when it comes to time as well. Yeah. yeah. My question was actually about emotional labor. So even if we think about like the personal tutoring system, um, we 
I have noticed strongly in, in our department um, that uh, the female students feel more comfortable coming to female members of staff. This is a double-edged, this, this is a two-pronged problem because this means that female students with male personal tutors are at a disadvantage in terms of, mm -hmm. of being supported. It also means that female members of staff are doing, I mean, a, hours and hours per week more emotional labor dealing with students with problems. Are, is there any research or are there any practical tips for how a department can balance not screwing the students by, you know, just yeah. giving male members of staff more students, but also not screwing the female it's members hard. of staff? And it's hard. And the problem goes further than that because the men also generally <coughs> prefer to talk to the women because the women are generally the preferred tutors um, because they're the ones more trained to do emotional labor and people, you know, expect them to be more nurturing. Um, I don't know what to do about it. Um, I'm very, in a way, I'm a very bad person to ask. Um, I'm pleased that I once won an award for personal tutoring, but it was a year when I didn't actually have any personal tutees, but they were all coming to me anyway, <laughs> so they nominated me for the award, and I thought, okay, I really do deserve this personal tutoring award, because, but, but it, it, it really shows that I need to learn how to say no, <laughs> or that other people need to be more accessible, and I... I don't know what to do about it because I'm not going to turn those students away when they need somebody to talk to and their tutor somebody who doesn't have the social skills. Um, and I, I don't know what to do about that. But there's, but there's qualities that perhaps we could all agree on, the qualities that we're talking about here that we think are more associated with women and more appropriate for the job of personal yeah. We know that men also have them, or can, and some men, and you know, if we all can point to many in that department who are outstanding personal yeah. tutors and the students feel very comfortable with female students as well as men. So actually that's a, it's an issue yeah. where, as you've said Jenny, so much of this has a broader relevance. So it might be then about broadening out the discussion about what makes a good personal tutor. Yeah. It's not being a woman, it's having these five key qualities and asking yeah. these kinds of questions or listening or, you know. So yeah. Well, and also, as, as you mentioned, another thing that occurs to me is thinking about that when you're hiring. Because right, yes. the people often th you focus just on whether they've got great, you know, they'll say, oh, well, you know, he has no social skills, but he's a great researcher. Mm -hmm. Well, the fact that he has no social skills is actually kind of relevant if you want someone to be able to do some of the job. Yeah. It's also training the students about implicit bias. Because the students will have implicit bias, but I really should go to the doctor mm -hmm. about problems. Yeah, that the woman will be more nurturing. Yeah. yeah. Which is not necessarily true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I wanted to sort of think about in a sort of wider context, really. I was, th I was thinking about two uh, phrases that you used. You said uh, but, uh, implicit bias is a product of a flawed society, and you also said it's a product of the human condition. So we might argue that they're a bit contradictory. Um, for instance, that the human condition is not some sort of trans historical, transcendental kind of permanence that it changes with time. Um, isn't it true that no matter how much particular institutions try to overcome these problems, that we are all um, um, uh, faced by uh, huge amounts of images, of bias everywhere that we go, in advertising, in the media, um, even on uh, university websites, on the front pages of university websites, everywhere we look there are these biases that are um, from day one, from, the, from when we're very young. So how do we overcome these if we don't start with very, very young children rather than start yeah. saying, you know... Okay, so first thing know. is the uh, human condition and flawed society. I think the tendency to form fast associations as part of the human condition, which associations we form as a product of our society. So you have different racial groups in different societies, different gender stereotypes in different societies. Which biases you form will vary from society to society and over time. And that's something that we have the potential to change. Um, we can also do things to block the operation of biases. Like anonymity is a great example where you just say, OK, yeah, we've got these biases, but we're going to keep them from affecting our marking by anonymizing. Right? So there's some things that are like that. But you're right. That ultimately, what any you know, these things are just sort of you know sticking plasters on, right? If you want to fix it, 
you have to change society, and that's a huge and difficult thing, but we do need to, you know, it's something to think about at every point, but it's much harder to feel like, you know, that's something that I could just go do now, rather than, you know, maybe you know, getting my department to try out anonymous long listing, that's something I can get my department to do. Just a very good question. I mean, it's a fantastic talk, and uh, I've learned a lot. Um, lots of it, though, is set up for a kind of very male-female world, right? And increasingly, the world is increasingly going more gender fluid. Yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> what implications does that have? For so, um, there's, you won't be surprised to hear there's almost none, no research on implicit biases and gender fluidity. Um, but, and one of the things is that because these, part of, I think there are lots of ways that these things interact, but part of what the, one of the problems you get if you're non-binary or if you're gender fluid is that the people you're interacting with have minds that are shaped by these biases, by the sort of binary social worlds that they've been raised in, and they are making these associations that, and you know, they, I mean, people who fall into one of the you know, two standard gender categories are also badly affected by these associations, but I think even more so if you don't, right? because you don't even get why people are doing this. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say, I think there's some very recent research um, in, over the past 10 years that started to actually look very explicitly at implicit bias and both sexuality and gender identity. So um, a couple of the people I'm thinking of are in the business school at Sussex, but they're doing um, psychological research. So Ben Everly um, is one who comes to mind. I can't think of anybody else that I could name right now, but I, there's a few people um, at UCLA doing also very similar research specifically on either um, non -bi people who identify as having non-binary gender or people who identify as being transgender. So. I have a question. Um, I guess this is a question not just for you but for everybody who might be able to offer advice. Um, just thinking of one example, I have a friend whose uh, brother recently graduated about three, graduated about three years ago from a theology, philosophy, theology PhD. Um, and he couldn't find a job for three years. Um, and it, he's, he's, now, he's now got one, but she has spent a frustrating few years trying to obviously be frustrated that her brother hasn't got a job. And when she talks about it, she says it's because um, philosophy and theology is trying to skew towards women because it's been kind of heavily put over by either way. And, she was saying that her brother's got six publications, but um, the average woman who gets hired in philosophy has only got one publication, how, how unfair. And I'm sitting there being like, I don't know how to respond to this yeah. in a way that is productive, particularly because she's my friend. But it, yeah. it, it, there's a way to be able to have those discussions and kind of be like, I'm really sorry it sucks for your brother that he's not got a job, but overall it's, it's a good thing for the department. For the well, department. I mean, it actually isn't the case that women are being favored in philosophy hiring. Um, so the most recent hiring, what, what it does look like is that women are being hired in proportion to the percentage in the applicant pool. Okay. Um, which is a big improvement, right? I mean, that shows that some of these efforts people are making to combat and implicit bias are making a difference. Um, <coughs> but what I think is a part of what can fuel that impression is, of course, you know, the political correctness on that kind of thing. But I think another thing that can fuel it is that there are departments that have no intention of hiring women who put women on their short list to show that they're shortlisting women. Um, and you know, in, in philosophy, on the American job market, they actually start with job interviews of, the, of their long list. They do it at the big philosophy conference. So like you interview like 30, 20, 30 people right, as the first phase of it, and departments will put a huge number of women into that because it's cost-free. They're not having to pay to fly anybody out, and they, they may not be serious at all about hiring women, but they want to show that they're taking women seriously, and so there's some evidence, I, I don't know if this is more than anecdotal, I'd have to check, um, that women are disproportionately likely to get interviewed at the big philosophy conference but not disproportionately likely to actually get shortlisted or hired. But the fact that they're more likely that they're more likely to be walking around with a lot of interviews at that conference can make it look like women are being favored when it's just departments trying to 
pretend to do the right thing. That's great. Thank you Thanks. so much, Jenny, um, for being complicit on this uh, implicit bias situation, <laughs> and uh, and we're all uh, all all joined you. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks a lot.